How are you doing? Are you still awake? I'll ask again. How are you doing? There we go. My name is Stephen Andrew. For those of you who do not know me, I am a reporter and television anchor for CTV News on Vancouver Island. Um, and I also host a radio talk show on CFAX 1070. Uh, have you had a chance to read the, the article in the paper yet? That's good. I started telling my story many years ago because I felt it was important that, you know, as a patient, I ask people on a daily basis to tell me their stories to, to make change in life. And uh, this is one thing that I am going to continue to do for as long as I possibly can. And I have a little secret to share with you today. I have found a cure to kidney cancer. When the applause dies down, I'll tell you what it is. <laughs> I know you're thinking, Stephen, how can you be such a genius? Well, I hear that all the time, actually. People say, you are such a know-it-all. And I'm an optimist, so I look on the good side of that, as you will find. Now, I discovered this just before the news in 2006 in November. I had this routine. I went to the washroom. And I'm standing there urinating in the urinal, and I thought, that's weird, someone's left something in the urinal. And I looked down, and it looked like this black thing, I couldn't tell, and I thought, well, why would someone put that in the urinal? And then I continued urinating. Now, if you can imagine, at that point, I'm like this. <laughs> if anybody had walked in at that point, they would have said, Stephen, why is your head buried in the urinal? There's something there. So I continue urinating, and then I discover that it's coming from me. And I thought, uh-oh, problem. So I immediately went and talked to Dr. Google, <laughs> who is a very brilliant individual, by the way, I must say. I mean, any question you ask Dr. Google, you will get 100 answers, um, most of them range from here to the other end. And I love Dr. Google because over the years, I mean, I've spoken to him many times. He also hands out free medical degrees as well as, uh, as my doctors tell me on a frequent basis, but that's okay. Um, and it said it could either just be a burst blood vessel or we could be all the way up to cancer. So then I went on this journey. I immediately called uh, my partner and said, this is what's happened, call the doctor. I called the doctor, the doctor said, any pain? I said, none whatsoever. Oh, should be fine then. But do come in and check next week. So I went in and checked. They scheduled me to see a urologist and also scheduled me for a ultrasound. Now, when I went to see the urologist, anyone had that wonderful job? Excuse all the urologists in the rooms right now. Um, they do this thing called a cystoscopy. Anyone had that? Hands up. Oh, you're going to love this story then. Um, they want to look in your bladder to see if you have uh, any nodules, because it could be bladder cancer. Now, some smart aleck years ago came up with the idea that they were going to do this by taking a long pole, and I'm not kidding, it's this big. Now, men, I know that we tend to over-exaggerate sometimes about the length of you-know-what. But really, I mean, this is what I would call optimistic. And <laughs> what they do with this long pole, on the end of it, they put a camera. And someone sadistic must, years ago must have thought to themselves, OK, now, what would be the most embarrassing, painful experience that would cause psychological distress to the patient we could possibly come in? I know. We'll go in through the penis. So they took this care, and he tells me I'm going to do this. Now, because I've already spoken to Dr. Google the day before about a cystoscopy, I know what they're going to do. So first of all, they put freezing in the end of the penis because they want to save you some modicum of embarrassment. And um, then they leave the room. Now, this gives you time to think. And as a journalist, I like to investigate. So I thought, well, rather than lie here for the five to 10 minutes that this hopefully freezing cream is going to take, 
I'll look around. So I look around, and I see something like this. Now look at the end of that. You can see that on camera. And I'm thinking in my head, there is no way that that is going to go in the end of my penis. But logic tells me it is. And it did. And they're saying to you as they're doing this, please try not to pee. <laughs> I have to tell you, peeing is not the thing I'm thinking about as that doctor's bamming that down and having a look. Surprisingly, it wasn't that painful. It was a little discomforting. And so if ever you have to go for that, I'm going to tell you guys, it's not that bad. And the benefits that you get from it are going to be, could save your life. So... The urologist said, I saw nothing, probably nothing, but his blood vessel will get you for an ultrasound. And I said, great, I'm going for that tomorrow morning. So I did in the morning. And um, those of you that are going through these uh, tests will know that any sigh or, oh, hmm, it, you just read into the world of it. So the following morning, they're doing the ultrasound, and they're taking a little bit longer than I think. And then I really start to get worried when the screen is turned away from me. <laughs> Dr. Gu, by this point, I should mention, has not taught me how to read um, a, uh, an ultrasound. But I left, and I got a call, 11.16 that day. I'm at work, getting ready to do a story on the air. And they said, yes, um, the doctor would like to see you about your tests. And I'm thinking, this is not good. So uh, they said, we're thinking 2 o'clock. I said, no, I'll come now, thank you. <laughs> and the a lady on the other end was very shocked, and she said, oh, okay. So I went, went over and discovered that I had a tumor in my kidney. Now, I have to tell you, I wasn't upset. For some strange reason, I guess I prepared myself for this, and so I said, what are we going to do? We're going to take it out. At that time, they determined the tumor was between eight and nine centimeters in the right kidney. And then I was scheduled for a CT and some blood work. When the results of that came back, they determined that the tumor was actually now growing and it was about 14 centimeters. The other problem we had was uh, a blood test that came back that indicated that my ALKFOS level, and you've probably seen this when it comes back, had risen. I said, what does that mean? I've since learned that it uh, could mean something or nothing. Uh, the theory was that it may have metastasized into my bone, and they also had seen a lump in my lung. So off we go. We go through um, a bone scan. And all this time, by the way, I have a television camera following me, so you can just imagine how fun that is. And um, the other thing is when they do the uh, bone scan, if anyone's had that, they inject this stuff into you and they come wrapped up it's looking something like Homer Simpson has gone into the nuclear reactor. And they cover themselves with this whole um, lead apron and they take out uh, this s syringe out of a container that has um, <laughs> warning nuclear signs on it. And I'm thinking, oh, that's interesting. They're going to inject that into you. Okay. So we went through that. Bottom line is no bone metastases, but I did have this thing in the lung. They took the uh, tumor out, a, a right radical nephrectomy, in uh, 2006, in, uh, just before Christmas. Um, and then in fe following February, we had a chunk of my lung out. And that was all the disease that I had until a couple of months later. I was going to see my oncologist in, um, at the Vancouver Cancer Agency. And I had said one day, I said, you know, I've got this pain. Mm -hmm. No, no, I have this pain. Oh, okay, yeah. Note it down. No, I really have this pain. Yes. Nothing happened. Well, I don't know why you would have that pain, and I don't know why you would have it there. That was on a Thursday. Two days later, I found myself in the emergency ward. I was really having a problem. And uh, it really turned out that what it was was constipation. 
And anyone who's had a right radical nephrectomy or any refractomy, you know you have to go through that wonderful purging situation. You know, and anyway, bottom line is that the bowels hadn't connected up, and I had to go through that again. And they said, but just to be on the safe side, come in tomorrow morning, we'll do another CT. Did another CT, and we found metastatic disease in my lungs. So that's when I went on this wonderful drug called Sutent, made by Pfizer. Now, anyone on Sutent? I will tell you, Pfizer, and I've said this before, made a huge mistake when they marketed this drug. They should market it as an extra strong super laxative <laughs> with the added benefit of not getting kidney cancer. It's rough, and I think that's one of the major side effects. I went on 37 and a half, uh, 37.5 uh, of the drug at the beginning, and I went through one dose. Now, this is a story, you've heard it several times here today about asking for a second opinion, but this is a story that I, I'm going to share with you. Um, Danny, my partner, and I went in to uh, see the... Uh, oncologist after the first um, session, and I had a little bit of a sore throat. And the oncologist started jumping up and down and saying, oh my God, this is not going to work. We're going to have to take you off the drug. Now, it had some concerns, especially with the ignoring the pain issue earlier. So the oncologist left the room, and Danny turned to me, and um, he can be overdramatic at times, but <laughs> rude. He said to me, Stephen, I want you to get a second opinion. This woman's going to kill you. <laughs> Which was enough for me to ask for a second opinion. So I did ask for a second opinion, and uh, they sent me to the Vancouver Cancer Agency, and that is where I met Christian Kohlmansberger. Now, Christian spends most of his time in my sessions laughing, and I don't know why that is, but he does. <laughs> But um, he took me through a whole process and said to me, so what do you want? I said, I'm taking 37.5, and I'm doing that uh, 28 on and um, 14 off, 14 days off. And he said, interesting. <laughs> and I said, interesting as that's wrong? And then his most ever so tactful way said, I would never criticize another doctor's um, treatment plan. So I said, okay, let me ask you another question. If you were treating me, what would you do? Well, I would probably more likely start you on 50 because we know that there's an efficacy issue here. And in a perfect world, keep you on it 365 days a year. So, and if, if you tolerate it. So at that point, I made a decision I was going to change oncologists, a second opinion. And now I spend my days with Christian looking over my medical history, something which he regrets. But we did that. And we did it for the simple reason that I decided I was going to take the drug for 28 days on at 50 milligrams and seven days off. There are side effects. I, do, I was getting mouth sores that were pretty bad. And I learned that baked potatoes with butter gets rid of that. Don't ask me why. Um, and uh, I did get some slight rash, and of course the, the, the diarrhea was a, a bit of an issue, which, you know, you stay close to home. And some mornings, really, to be totally honest, I didn't want to go to work. And I learned not to go to work. Stay home. It was probably the best thing to do, go back to bed and go to sleep. I took the drug at night time. Um, after I went to a conference in Toronto, and I met uh, another um, medical oncologist, uh, Georg Berenson, who... who advocates uh, that you should be taking it at night. There's a clinical term for that, Christian. What is it? Taking the drug at night time or? Metronomic therapy. There we go. We have a good way for everything. That's what we pay them the big bucks. <laughs> Metronomic therapy. So anyway, I took it at night time and, and uh, went through that. Um, I can tell you that uh, That was in 2007. Later that year, I just, we were having our um, wedding reception a year after we got married, by the way, but um, had a wedding reception, and I was asking people not to hug me because I had 
pain, back pain, really bad back pain. And we found that I had a lesion on my T11. The first step on that was to do um, regular radiation. Now, I don't know why I agreed to do this, to be honest with you, because I knew by that time, because I'd spoken to my friend Dr. Google, and Dr. Google had indicated, as most articles, journal references said, that kidney cancer is extremely resistant to radiation. But I did it anyway, and it continued to grow. So we didn't know what to do. So we came back, and Christian referred me to Dr. John Street here in Vancouver, and he said there are three options. One, we can resect the uh, vertebrae where that tumor is. 30% morbidity rate. Number two, we can embolize the tumor, and that basically means they'll take some crazy glue, they'll find the vein that's feeding the tumor, shut it off, and then hope that it would kill the tumor. Third one was stereotactic radiation, said Dr. Street. But it's not done in Canada. You may have to go to the States and pay for it. We were fully prepared at that time to sell a house and do whatever we had to. But Christian found that there was a study in Toronto, a Canada-wide study from Princess Margaret Hospital. So I went there. Stereotactic radiation, five days, which is a very intense beam. They put you in this model, uh, this uh, mold that they build, they tattoo you, and then they basically give you a very light CT scan and they shoot you with a very, very intense beam of radiation. And it's higher than anything you would get. And, they, and, they, and what they do is if they're shooting, if this is the tumor on the side, they'll shoot into the tumor and not the spine. And you have to lay still. They give you some Ativan ahead of time just to kind of ease you out a little bit. And the theory is that um, they have to get very, very close to it to, sh to, to attack it. But if they come too close to the spine, it could paralyze you. And the margin of error is about three millimeters. So you can imagine how this went. Obviously, you can tell it didn't paralyze me, but it did stop the growth of the tumor. For about two years now, there's been no evidence of disease in my lungs. They can't see it. Doesn't mean it's not there. I say I'm cured. I get one person applauding. <laughs> but it's sufficient. And the thing I can share with you now, I have really not been taking the drug since July of last year. Still no evidence of disease. But I'm a realist. I know it can come back. We talked today a little bit about. Um, how was that with being honest to your doctor? Yeah. <laughs> he just learnt that. Well, I said I couldn't remember when, but it was a couple of months ago. Right. Yeah, so I wasn't totally dishonest. Um, the thing, this morning you heard about removing. Um, negative vampires from your life. I'll tell you a couple of very brief stories about that. My mother, God love her, is somebody who, when my dad was sick, she would call me every day and tell me that he was dying, and would tell my other brothers that he was dying. And it got a little bit tiring after a while, and of course we had this conversation away from her that, you know, it was annoying, and I said, well, you know, one day she's going to be right. So when this first happened, I did an article with the Times Colonists, and they talked about it. And my brother called me up, unbeknownst to me. It's amazing how people talk behind your back when you have a disease. They don't want to confront you. And he said, my brother loves soccer and spends 98% of his life in soccer shorts and a soccer shirt. And he teaches school in Toronto. And not a fashion maven by any ways. And he's very, very abrupt. And he said to me, I've got a question to ask you. And I said, yes. He said, did, did you tell mum that you're going to die in two years? Mm, no. Well, she says you are. <laughs> and I've had enough of this, and I'm going to call her up, and I'm going to give her ick. I said, okay, fine. Uh, let me do that. So I called up my mum, and I said, mum, did you tell Howard 
that um, I'm going to die in two years. Silence. Well, yes, I did. <laughs> Can I ask where you got that from? Because I have not shared that with you. Well, in the newspaper. I said, what newspaper? Well, the article in the newspaper. So I said, okay, could you get it for me? She said, can you read to me where it says, I'm going to die in two years? Yes, well, Dr. Coleman's broker says, if you take 100 Stephen Andrews and put them in a room, we can tell you with pretty much certainty who is going to die and who is going to survive. Interesting. So, Mum, what does that mean? Well, I don't know, really. <laughs> Mum, I think it means that if you put 100 Stephen Andrews, 100 anybody's in a room, they can tell you who's going to survive and who's going to die. Oh, yes. Yes, well, I'll get that. So, Mum, I'm curious. Why would you put me in the group that's going to die? <laughs> Without a word of a lie, she says, well, I didn't want to be disappointed. <laughs> the funny thing is I actually understood what she meant. She, she didn't want to self, set herself up for disappointment that I wasn't going to survive. The thing is, and she has told me many times since then, she doesn't know how I do it, how I survive how I live with this. I will tell you, um, it could be attitude. It could be the ability of the fact that I advocate for myself like no other. I am informed. I have a great support network. I have a great oncologist. I have a relationship. I'm not afraid to ask questions. I know sometimes they're difficult, but you will get an answer. And I think you have to advocate for yourself. We've talked about this many, many times. And to put it bluntly, all oncologists are not created equal. All urologists are not created equal. And, and I don't wish to offend any oncologists in the room, but I will tell you that there are some people that will look at you a little strange if you ask for a second opinion. But think about this. They're not the one, after you've been given information that you're going to die in 11 months, that really, I would say, are going to care. How many, can I have hands up in the room, how many people have actually been given a prognosis that, you know, whether their survival is two months, three months, six months, seven months, or whatever? Can I see a show of hands? Well, do yourselves a favor. Go get a lottery form and give it to the oncologist and say, would you please pick out the winning numbers? Because they have as much chance of predicting that as they do of telling you when you're going to die. I can tell you that. They can tell you pretty much certainty at advanced stage of disease what's going on. But again, get yourself a second opinion. Ask the questions if there are clinical trials. A couple of things that I do a little bit different than perhaps most. I go for acupuncture every single week. I think that that has helped me to ward off the effects of the student. That um, when I had an upset stomach, I never got sore feet. I did get the sore mouth thing, as I've, I've told you, but I think it helped me to balance me and create... Um, enough of a resistance to what was going on that I could survive that 50 milligrams on and uh, then the seven days off. So I would, I recommend that for anybody. Um, I'm going to get into trouble for saying this, but if anyone says do radiation, ask them about stereotactic radiation. It is available now in British Columbia, am I correct? It is. And I'm going to put you on the spot because this is a question that wasn't asked of you. Would you advise regular radiation or stereotactic radiation? No, I would, I, so I, I would prefer stereotactic radiation depending on the situation because not every radiation can be replaced with stereotactic radiation. There, it's, it's a very sophisticated technique which is suitable for, for very localized processes. So in Stephen's case, there was one spot in his body which was 
very well circumscribed. It was an ideal case for something like that. They, they, they radiated a very high dose in a very circumscript area. Um, but it's not for every situation. Now, the people here in Vancouver without that big deep available are very experienced. So you can always ask and get an opinion. That's not the issue. But it may not be the best thing for each situation. But you can ask. I have five minutes more to entertain you, regale you with mother stories, but I, I'll move on. Um, I, what I also will say, um, very key thing that we learned, and this is about having access to surgery. When I went to my thoracic surgeon, we learned very quickly, by the way, to get a copy of medical records. Um, they are accessible. In British Columbia, you just have to go to the Freedom of Information office at the uh, BC Cancer Agency. You can ask for your entire file. They will give it to you. They will write, what records do you want? Um, get them all. But don't tell them I sent you. Because they'll hate me for that. And then we started walking around with these in a binder. When I went for my surger, surgery here, and I also had an x-ray uh, about it, and I learned that one doctor may not be aware of another uh, blood work that had been done or another evaluation report or whatever. So I go into my thoracic, thoracic surgeon, the guy that took out the chunk of my lung, and I'm chatting up his receptionist. They can give you tons of information. He was late. And I said, when does he do surgery? Oh, he does them on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Does he have any time? Yes, he does, actually. He's got time in three weeks' time here. I said, thank you. So I sat down with him, and he began to put blocks up. Well, if there's one spot, I'm sure there's many others. He's umming and ahhing. And I said, he said, but I need an x-ray. Here's the x-ray. Well, I'd need blood work. Here's the blood work. And he starts looking at me. He said, but there's one spot. I'm sure there's others. And I said, but we can't see them, so let's assume there's only one. And he goes, well, I don't know when I can fit you in. And I said, <laughs> your receptionist says you can do me in three weeks' time. He walked out, came back, and said, actually, I can do you sooner. I'm, to this day, not sure he would have done it. I think he would have done the let's wait and see approach to see what was going to happen. So get your records and be a strong advocate. Um, participate in studies, absolutely. I also need to tell you about something that I don't, haven't heard anybody mention. And this is a key thing. I think Christian's going to stand up and give me his own standing ovation for this. But if you are having a tumor removed, any part of the tumor removed, if it's going to happen, ask your surgeon, your urologist, your oncologist, to see if you can donate the tissue from your tumor to a tissue repository bank. Very important. It costs you nothing. You have to sign a form. But this tissue will go a long way to advancing kidney cancer research down the road. Am I? And it's one of the number one things that came out. So you ask, because oncologists, sorry, not oncologists, urologists will not always ask you that question. But you advocate. Make sure you get it in the Tissue Repository Bank. We have a great one in, on Vancouver Island, and that's something really that I would strongly advocate for. I think it's a very, very important thing. At the beginning, I said I found a cure for cancer. I guess really what I should have said was I found a cure of cancer for me right at this moment, and I hope it continues. I think that for you, and this goes for anybody, whether it's patients, doctors, caregivers, anybody who are friends, relatives, you could put yourself in the same position. I really believe there's hope. Fight. Don't give up. You saw that graph. You saw that 2003, very little hope. 2004, it got better. It gets better every day. Organizations like Kidney Cancer Canada have advanced that. They, you have no idea how the advocacy work that we do as patients and friends and relatives and, and, and the medical teams really advance how we have got to where we are today. 
One final story I will leave you with. Pfizer, when they began, uh, Christian referred to it earlier on today, that um, it came online in, when was it available, 2005 to you? The, the study, 2005. And so it was 2007 that the drug actually became available and British Columbia would pay for it. And I'm not bragging, but I'll tell you a story. I was fully aware of this drug coming off a study phase, and they were giving it compassionately to patients with kidney cancer. And what I had learned, the only way that you would get it after the study was going to be en was ending with Pfizer, if you, had, if you didn't have money, if you didn't have a health killer plan, there was no way for you to get it. Basically, if you got kidney cancer after the end of the study, and you weren't in the study, you were going to die, bottom line. So I asked George Abbott, the health minister at the time, to come on my radio show and talk to me. Mr. Abbott did not come on prepared. And I hounded him like a dog. <laughs> and I said to him, so, health minister, basically what you're telling me is if I, a friend of mine gets kidney cancer in four weeks' time, and they don't have the money to pay for it, they're going to die. He didn't know what to say. So to get out of it, he said, Stephen, all I can tell you is if the BC Cancer Agency tells me that it's a drug that we need, we'll find a way to pay for it. The noose was tightened around his neck at that point. And... Uh, they were listening over here at the BC Cancer Agency, and I don't know how quickly the letter went out to tell him that they needed it, but clearly it saved many lives. You can do the same thing. Please support the organization. I credit Kidney Cancer Canada, Christian, my partner, and every person in the medical team that's helped me for living here today and being able to come and talk to you and share you my story. November 2006, peeing in a urinal, discovering a blood clot. Today, talking to you, no evidence of disease. Thank you. <laughs>